So hello, everybody. Of course, this is Dr. Keith McNally, and this is the Question Guy podcast, and I'm here with Dr. Potan. Yes. Yeah. And I always want to get the name. I always want to get names right because it would embarrass me if I didn't. But <laughs> I am just delighted to have you with me because you are so busy, and you are parents. You're an educator. You're a scientist. You're a TED speaker twice over, I believe. And you continue, I think you're on a, an advisory board as well, if, if I'm not correct, um, or if I'm not mistaken. So there's so many questions. There's so much I would like to talk to you about. But let's start with where you're, what you're doing now. What are you, what's going on with your life? Right oh, now. wow. Yeah. Thank No, I mean, first, thank you so much for um, this platform. I mean, I'm always happy to share. And I, th I think I remember seeing, you know, one of your first few podcasts and I was like, oh, this is really neat. And, um, and I think when you reached out, I'm like, oh, we really need to have a conversation. So I'm really glad to have this opportunity to speak. Um, cool. Wow. What do I do? I mean, I don't know where to start because I am involved in a lot of things. I think I'm the type of person where I, I thrive when I'm in different areas of either research or work or consultancy or volunteering. Um, the diversity of types of things that I do is what feeds my energy. And, um, and, and, and I think in the end is that I love working with people who have the same values, the same vision. I love talking to people who you know, believe in the same causes and things like that. So I think maybe that's how I've added many things to my play. I tend to say yes, um, you know, way too many times. I do say no as well, but you know, I tend to say yes too many times. Um, but then what's your passion? What are you doing to these days? Yeah, so my current passion right now is um, helping high school students and kids, you know, to go into science, like go into a STEM field. Okay. Um, and so... I, I not only share science with students, but I also want to help them understand and practice the skills of science, like uh, questioning, theorizing, hypothesizing, and sort of building their research capacity. Uh, because usually with science is that at school, we get a lot of textbook knowledge. Yeah. Um, you know, we get to read chapters and teachers give you tests. And most of the students I've helped, even at university, they're very good at knowledge. They'll do really well you know, in, in a regurgitation test type of thing. But when it comes to... But that's um, not science. Not, um, yeah, okay, yeah, that's not... That's not, that's, that's uh, not specifically science. to science. Yeah, that's, right. not, that's not specifically so, to science, so, yeah. So what is science? How do you, how would you go about grasping what is science? Oh, well, I think for me, science is everywhere. Science is, is not just about looking, you know, down a microscope and having a beaker as a pipette. It's not that. It's the practice of questioning and then question those questions. Um, how to interpret data? Why are you interpreting those data in a way um, in a way that it's you know uh, presented? Um, and making informed decisions. I mean, I mean, sure, you know, we can classify that as science. We can classify that as critical thinking or scientific thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a process that I think at us as citizens of you know of whichever country or whatever parts of the world that you're listening from. Um, it's a tool to help us make sound decisions for even our personal lives, right? Not even, not, not just in our research and work. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I classify that as science just because um, in research, in the lab, we do that most often. Like we constantly check our assumptions, we constantly check our questions, we recheck and our theories change, right? That's what, that's what science is. It changes as as we get more facts, as we learn more. So mm -hmm. it never really stays the same. So I, I always carry my pen. And so with every conversation, I write things down because one, I think things people say ha have such value. So science involves a, is involved with a lot of questions. And yeah. I'm all into that because I've already branded myself the question guy because I yeah. ask a lot of questions. But yeah. I think knowing that if we explore the process of learning about science or the process of learning yeah. science I, I think we we grasp so much more about life and i've kind of yeah. just kind of wanted to step in I, this is kind of a backstory of mine because i do want to i do want to learn more about what's going on with you but the age-old question is you know especially with 
higher level math, you know, algebra. I'll never learn, you know, the, the kids always ask, you know, why do I need to learn this? I'm never going to use it. And my thought has always been, even at a younger age, is you may not use it as it's designed in the math class, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you are learning to think in a more abstract, more defined, more critical way just by learning yeah. algebraic equations. And it can, of course, it can build from there. And so I always think that there's nothing really lost in the classroom, hopefully, yeah. because it gives you the, the tools, you know, like yeah. you said, to, to reach into other areas of life. And I think science is most critical because the scientific method gives us that process of thinking, you know, yeah. go observe, go touch, um, you know, Go find out what's going on. And you do that. In our first conversation, I've, I remember you saying that you take, you took kids out to the field, like where you brought something yes. to, to the classroom. How does that, how did that work? Yeah, it works great. And I, and I really love that you, you know, talk about how, you know, like we use like um, math and then, you know, kids asking, why am I learning science? Why am I learning math? I don't want to be a mathematician. I don't want to be a scientist, right? <laughs> so I get those questions as well. But it's that you've hit it. It's the process. It's going through the process of, say, practice, the process of trial and error, the process of experimenting, asking questions. I mean, in the end, like for me, my, even my kids, we do it every day. I mean, we ask questions, didn't work, try again, so find a different way. And I'm glad you brought up the scientific method. I mean, the scientific method is, is a way that scientists follow, but it's also flexible enough that um, it allows different questions to come up, right? So we're not so rigid as in, this is the only way to do it, or this is the only way to ask about science. Um, and, you know, right now I'm, I'm almost completing my second PhD, but um, this whoa, time whoa, it's- Whoa, 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 <laughs> what, what? <laughs> What's your first PhD in? Uh, stem cell biology. So I'm a stem what? cell biologist. But okay, so what's your second PhD in? It's in science education and scientific literacy. Oh, well, how far are you, are you into the dissertation? Is yeah, it... I'm pretty much a few months away. So I've already written it and um, I'm just working on my final draft. And yeah, I'm pretty, it's pretty much three months away from completing. So Well, congratulations. So what was, <laughs> well, now I've got a whole different set of questions, but I, I didn't want to ask about your, your research study, but is it more focused on what you're doing now? Because you're in you're in the educational space. Yeah, yeah, and and I think having the two PhDs in, in you know so ingrained in both uh, fields, like in the in sort of like the biology, microbiology, genetics field, like I was you know doing science in the lab, you know, I was experimenting with animals and things like that, and so for this second PhD, it was it was vastly different, right? Because it was very philosophical from more from a qualitative perspective. Um, and it's definitely a shift in thinking. So this is what I'm saying is that when, when I teach about science or when I train teachers about teaching science, it's to sort of zoom out a bit when even when you're teaching science, like look at the story behind the cells that you are teaching about. Look at, um, find out about the stories from your students. Like, what do they know? Um, what are they, what are they, um, what do they know from their own cultural background about that particular topic in science? So throughout this sort of second PhD journey, as I'm completing it, I realized that, you know, taking kids out to the field, as you say, or bringing uh, specimens back, that's sort of like the first couple of stepping stones to sort of introduce science in a way where it's more contextual, so that we're not just looking at things through a tunnel. Right. So that's sort of where my passion lies. And that's why a lot of my research, a lot of sort of what I teach in the class, both to students and to teachers, resonates with that. Um, so one example is um, a research project that I'm doing two, with two nonprofits in Vancouver, Canada. So one of them is with Science World. So Science World is uh, British Columbia's sort of science museum. And it's like, it has like a big dome sort of like building. And then the second one is the Van Dusen Garden or Blodel Conservatory. So they're both slightly different because Blodel Conservatory is, is more about plants, is more about ecology and nature, whereas Science World is more about physical sciences, biology. Um, there's, there's, I don't think there's any plants in there. I think it's more like um, the, the other, the other part of science, right? 
Okay. Uh, so yeah, both of my research that are there uh, hinges and is rooted in teaching science in a way where students and teachers and little kids, even the public, I share my research with the public as well. How does that relate and how is it relevant to you? That's where the story is. And that's how you get people to care. Oh, I like that. Do. I like that angle. How, how does it how is it relevant to you? And how do you draw that in? Because science is all around us. You know, I, I've, yeah. I've wrote I've, I've written stories about um, yeah. how there is a situation here locally where I am, where yeah. they're doing a lot of commercial residential building. Right. Which means they're tearing about tearing down the wildlife. They're tear, yeah. tearing down the natural resources. And that really affects the ecology of our local area. And and so that was a big project in the middle school area um, about understanding that. And so it, it really does affect, it's going to affect us, but it also affects, you know, the wildlife and the habitat areas here locally yeah. and in a negative way, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. And I think bringing in that story piece and, and when I'm talking about science to the public and other people, not everyone's going to jump on board and say, okay, I'm 100% with you. You know, I totally believe what you say. I'm, I'm totally converted, right? So <laughs> um, you're not going to get anyone that are like that. You might get a few that are like, wow, I didn't realize. And yeah. oh my gosh, right? You have to uh, so, raise awareness. Yes, but I, I, not everyone is ready for that awareness. But, oh. even if they're not, but even if they're not, they're not ready, at least they are informed. Okay. And with that information, you give them a tool. You give them one tool of many in the toolbox. I mean, I don't really use tools, but I'm using a tool analogy. But let's just say, you know, they're looking at, at a toolbox. And if you just give them only the hammer, let's just say, you don't explain anything else, then at least they have that one tool. And they can make the decision next the next time they go and speak to their friends or, you know, maybe they're in a crowd and they'll say, you know, I actually learned this um, recently when I attended this event. And that would spark the conversation. And that's yes. sort of how the ripple effect goes, um, because as um, advocates or even scientists or even educators or even like yourself, is that we can't really it, it's really tough to tell people like, this is what you need to do. This is what you're not. And people don't um, want to hear that. And people don't want to hear that. Yeah. Right. So in the end is that you hope that you have given them enough information that they would take it upon themselves as steps towards having them be, be more aware. And then that awareness turns into action and that action turns into change, you know? So, um, and are you seeing that? Are you seeing the action become yeah. change? Yeah, it takes time. Like it's not an overnight thing. And again, right. uh, it depends who you're talking to. Ones who are already know that there's a problem. Like for example, the exam the, the thing that you gave, example that you gave, they already sort of know, they already know the history behind it. And now they have the tool for the action. And that action can look very different. It can be a letter to your government or it can be uh, volunteering for an organization or even as far as starting a grassroots sort of system, like organization, right? right, right. Um, but the key thing is that is to have, if to have to give them the tools so they feel empowered that they can do something. Because in the end, if we were to tell everybody, this is how you need to do it, <laughs> this is how, then it becomes like, oh, well, what does that have anything to do with me? Right. It's not in my backyard. Right. <laughs> so, so that kind of, you know, sparked a question in, in my head is what's the youngest audience that you've reached out to? Because I think the younger yeah. your audience or our audience, the more likely they are to kind of grow up, grow up in, in, in a new way of thinking, of questioning, of, you know, data interpretation, of informed decisions, action and outcomes, right? So what's the youngest yeah. audience? I mean, I could be wrong, but I'm thinking the younger we reach them, the better off we are in yeah. transforming their way of thinking. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Um, the youngest I've um, connected with is uh, three years old. Well, two and a half, I guess, if you round it up. Are, are they ready to make <laughs> changes? <laughs> you know, maybe they themselves not, but they have conversations with their parents. Okay. They, yeah, they might not be the ones who say, you know, go out there, rah, 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 and say, I want to do this. But the conversations that they bring back to their parents and, you know, in the end, it's like it's 
um, you know, parents might not, you know, go out the next day and start like doing things, but the conversation that happens between them sort of gets the parents thinking. It's like, oh, my kid is thinking this way. Hmm, I wonder. And I'll give you an example. So this is where it's this is part of my research, right? And it's um coming out in a different publication in a different book. Part of, so okay, this is different. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's a different book. So the book that um just came out, which I have here actually, this is the one. So this is the one that's called Recentering Lives and Lived Experiences in Education. Is that so on Amazon? Is, um, I'll put the link in the description. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I can send you the link. Yep. Okay. So um that's my research with education uh, through an indigenous lens and okay. uh, specifically science education. So the second one that's uh, in sort of in press right now, um, usually publication sticks along, but in press right now, that one specifically uh, talks about the research I'm gonna tell you about, which is working with uh, preschool children, uh, three, three, four and five year olds. Okay. And they, you know, this is the group that, you know, we took them out to sort of like what, what we call touch grass, right? <laughs> like they would feel nature, you know, get more nature. And a lot of them, because of maybe, it could be a cultural influence or it could be, I don't know, different, different family, different families are different, right? Like different families. So they might not go out to nature as much as other families. Okay. So when I came in, uh, we started talking about uh, biodiversity and we started talking about different types of biomes around the globe and what, why are they important, um, what role they play and how does, it, how, does a, how does a biome that's really far from us, how does it affect us all the way in Canada? Type of thing, right? okay. So we talked about that and um, it was a 17 week research project. And after the 17 weeks, the, the kids would have to start, would start to have conversations with their parents. Hmm. And they would start saying, mom, dad, about this biome, did you know that I learned about uh, uh, this animal really depends on this plant? Well, they don't use the word depend, but they'll say, oh, this animal needs this fruit to eat and live. And because it's sweet, like, okay, like that. But it's those conversations that sort of percolated in the parents' minds. And now... They go out on walks more often, for example. Yeah. yeah. And you, and that's a 17 week research project? Research. Yeah. yeah. 17, research pro 17 week research project with a preschool um, in Vancouver. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> well, that was a lot of effort. And, and what was the result of all that? I mean, what was, what literally, you know, you talked about action and change. What was, is there any change? Um, Change just takes a long time. I mean, I see well, it want as, a long time. Uh, the, you're you're the expert here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean the the change can come in different forms, right? Like, I mean, uh, like I said before, is that it can come in, you know, like going out there and starting a grassroots thing and then doing your right. thing, right? right? But if we think about the kids from the perspective of change, um, their change is that their thinking has shifted. I think that's the golden nugget. Is that when when someone's thinking has been decentralized from what they originally know or have been taught in school from mm -hmm. a from a more centralized point of view, then questions start to happen. Curiosity starts to become really strong. And with that curiosity, then kids starts to ask more questions. And when they ask more questions, they learn more. And then when they learn more, they get more tools in their toolbox to make to make decisions and to be informed, right? So I think that's the major change that definitely I saw during that um that project cool. um I like and that. as edu yeah and as ed educators I think we can't really see the effect until I don't know even maybe like a decade later like who knows how many of those students that I worked with right what they do right. with that information right right so well that's a really cool story I like that and it 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 really it, it because they were a part of that they are going to take that with them because typically, like you said earlier, if you're just learning something in a textbook and it's just words on a page and pictures on a page, it really yeah. doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean much at the very least. But if yeah. they're actually engaging and participating, it's going to impact them directly. So hopefully, yeah, hopefully we'll see something in about 
five, 10 years. Yeah. Um, and like you said, if it's just that little golden nuggets of, you know, thinking and what can I do with this information and how is it going to impact me, my family, my world? Yeah. Then you've done the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. And the most important part of that part of research is that um, I invited all the students who wanted to share, uh, who were comfortable in sharing their story of, of, you know, whichever biome or places that they've been. It could be a park. It could be, it could be an urbanized sort of, you know, thing as well. But I sort of gave them the space to tell us that, you know, what, what are some of the things that you remember when you went to Bloedel, for example? Or what are some things you remember when you just took a walk around the block um, and you look around? What did you notice? So when you sort of introduce um, and give an opportunity to even young students as young as three mm -hmm. and you let them speak, they feel um, that Empowered. included and that yeah. inclusion makes the learning even more authentic. And um, some of the teachers that I taught before that this technique, uh, teachers who have te taught for a long time who's not used to this technique, sometimes may feel like uh, it's so new that they would feel a little bit that they're losing a little bit of control mm -hmm. because you know they, there's a certain lesson plan, there's a certain curriculum, we need to follow this, right? Uh, but it's totally fine to deviate from the lesson plan. Even if you do step one of the lesson plan and you don't do the rest, <laughs> it's sort of just to follow and allow that question to happen from the students, right? I mean, as long as it's on, on, on topic, it's not like talking about cartoons right, right, and stuff like right. that, but um, that's where you get the learning happenings. So what's next for, for you? What, what's after the dissertation, after the second PhD. <laughs> There's got to be something because you never let time just kind of sit idle. <laughs> no, no. I think what's next. Oh man, my my what's next is already happening. Uh, right now, I'm working with different organizations to sort of understand their their uh, lesson plans, their their how they teach signs, and sort of training them on. Uh, a different way. I'm not saying a better way, a different way to teach science, how to connect to curriculum, how to connect uh, to science in, in a more relational, social way. Um, and also to sort of train them to understand how, how to let go a little bit in your classroom. And, and I, when I use the word classroom, it could be an informal group, it could be an informal teaching, but to just let go a little bit and treat treat your learning and teaching session as more like a facilitation rather than I'm the teacher and I'm imparting knowledge on you, right? So it's more of a facilitator, coach, mentorship role. Because I believe that when mentorship happens side by side, instead of the mentors saying, I'm going to do this and I'm going to teach you this because I know it all, right? Then that's sort of where learning it, it, it's, it's not diverse, like it doesn't get opened up. Right. So I think my, my style of mentorship is that we walk the same path. We walk the same path together. I have as much as learned from you as you have as much to learn from me and we do it together. Um, and in terms of what next is that, uh, yeah, so that's what I'm doing next. I'm also part of SWIS, which is the Society for Canadian Women in Science and Tech. Um, I'm, its, I'm its current president since July. So I'm really excited about that. Um, cause the other part of my passion is oh, so you just became yeah, in July. Okay. Yeah. I was, I was a director before and then, uh, um, and then, yeah, we had our AGM and, uh, members and directors voted and I'm the president. Cool. <laughs> so really I like cool. that. So yeah, I know you're busy and I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. How can people who watch this and listen to the podcast and listen to our conversation, how can they get in touch with you and. Of course, how can they get a hold of your books? Yeah, so uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm at, um, I'll, I'll give you all the little links later, but I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm not on Facebook, so I'm not on Instagram either, although I'm trying to start. <laughs> um, I have a website, it's called uh, gotanphd.ca. That is where it's listed all of my publications, both in the sciences, and also in education. Okay. Um, so a lot of my is that your primary point of contact? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Potan okay. Yeah. 
And then uh, if I think in the and in the end, if you just Google me, I'll pop up. There's not <laughs> there's not that many potans in that world. So. Especially do yeah, not doctors, think, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Yeah, so it's not that many. So um, you'll stumble upon my two TEDx talks as well. So if you Google that, um, other things is that uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I usually post um, a bit on you know like educational perspectives, um, sort of strategies of learning and teaching and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, I also have co-published books with my kids uh, really? about, yeah, being a scientist. And cool. one of them is called, one of them is called, am I a scientist? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but it's geared towards um, K to grade three, like kind of, right, preschool, kindergarten, and up to grade three. That's still, that's great. That's awesome. Well, good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I am so proud to have... <laughs> I'm proud to have this conversation. I'm honored. <laughs> and so thank you so much, Dr. Po Tan. I love it. And I get the name thank right. I should just get credit for getting the name right. I love it. <laughs> no, thank you so much, Keith. And when, when do I get to see you again? <laughs> oh, wow. Anytime you want. I mean, I would love to bring on my eldest son. He's the one I co-authored with, a um, couple yeah. of books with. Um, Is he the one I met before? Yes. Yeah, he's he's full of yeah. energy too. That would be awesome. Yeah. Do you think he would be comfortable on? I think so. On camera. Yeah. yeah, he's he's presented with me at academic conferences since he was five years old. Oh gosh. <laughs> well, you are just yeah. raising him just the right way, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's the right way, but he's interested. So I'm like, okay, let's do it. You know. And oh yeah. I I I usually ask him. I I I never say you must do this. I said I'm doing this presentation. I mean, you know, and the other time was um. I did a science fair project. He did a science fair project. I'm like, do you do you want to present it? You don't have to. He was like, oh yeah, I want to present it. I'm like, yeah. Okay, well, he's cool. seen you cool. do it, so how can it be? It can't be that hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I train him hard too. Oh you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, let's do it again. This is fun. I appreciate that, Doctor. Thank you so much for your time. And for those who are watching, of course, this is the Question Guy podcast. We'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>